Hi everyone. Um, I think I had the privilege to do the introductions today. So we're very, very happy to welcome Irina Wojkulescu, Associate Professor at the Department of Computer Science, University of Oxford at AUA. I think this is a big honor for us. And I'm doubly happy because I've had the privilege of being her student for five years there. And essentially, those were the years that formed me as, as a scholar. So all, all my gratitude to her for that. And this is only a glimpse into the multitude of the different types of research that Irina and her group uh, work on at the University of Oxford. So please uh, ask questions whenever you're interested and let's make this an interesting discussion. And without further ado, I'm going to... Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, the pleasure is mine, and um, whatever we have done together is because of your interest, not necessarily solely because of mine or my groups. I think it's always exciting when people get together and, and there is some chemistry there that, that helps us uh, move science forward. And um, when I was at your stage, I um, went to talks where... Um, scientists from elsewhere were talking about their work. And it's not necessarily that I followed in exactly their footsteps. I didn't necessarily go and say, yes, this is, this is the area I want to work in. But I think just seeing how close research actually is to the, to the scientific curriculum of the, of the degree, I think helps you realize the unsolved problems are within reach and you can go and pick your own domain and and think of where you feel you can get excited enough about the science to spend a number of years or a lifetime and and pick something and and move forward with it and i think that that's what we all do we we find something interesting and we spend five minutes on it and then we spend five hours on it and then five years later we're still there. And in our case, the five years have long gone, but I think, you know, 15 years from now, we may still be working in this area because we will, we will not necessarily exhaust it. Um, so I would like to talk about semantic segmentation because this is something that has preoccupied me and my group for a number of years. And it, we've done some stuff, and I will, sh I will show you kind of where we got to with it and what methods we've used. Um, but I also want to emphasize that it's not important or it's not essential. It is important, but it's not essential to be perfectionist about it. So how good is good enough? Is it that we have achieved a segmentation that is going to get us somewhere or not? And I think, you know, the, the um, question is, open to interpretation and you will you could tell me no actually what you've done is not enough but for some applications um, I think I think that we we can help the science the computer science science and the clinical science move forward so we call ourselves actually Varduhi this is due to you you came up with the Oxford Medical Image Segmentation Group and we called ourselves the Image Segmentation Group for a while until we started working in landmark detection and doing some other stuff so we are now Oxford Medical Image Solutions <laughs> um, or imaging solutions okay there's a there's a delay and um, we do, and for the purpose of today, I will just say that we do largely segmentation. I can talk about landmark identification tomorrow or something like that. And what makes us tick is that we're interested in the maths. We spend all our time, and we have collectively between us spent most of our time thinking about mathematics and a little bit of algorithmics and data formats, but largely the science of it. But we find particular excitement in the fact that the surgeons also want to know about this. So we don't necessarily just take a public data set and measure something about it and then apply an algorithm, but rather we talk to clinicians and what we do here, we're, we're not going to take over their clinical decisions. 
Um, this is not something that they are interested in and we don't feel that what we do has the backing to claim that we are going to do automated diagnosis. That, that, that whole ethical discussion is for other people to, to, to debate. Um, but through what we do, through, through semantically taking things out of images and, and interpreting their meaning, we help them make their decisions and we can de reconstruct it and display it. If you ever need a plastic spine, I know how to make one. Um, we give them maybe a, a way of turning their information around, looking, looking at the models that we create and, and seeing their data from a different angle, both physically and metaphorically. Um, and we have also approximated volumes, the volumes of the organs and bones and the things that we have reconstructed. Um, we have taken an interest in anatomical measurements. These can be angles, they can be distances, again, not necessarily within segmentation so easily. And ultimately, what they do with this information is that they can plan their life. They can help themselves um, decide whether this patient is going to belong to the group that needs immediate help or whether they can just go home and do some exercises and come later. This is in the case of osteoarthritis, um, for example. So if, you know, if they have joint pain, are we going to cut their bones out or are we going to let them suffer in pain? Um, and so I can show you a few examples of clinical applications. So with a volumetric, I talked about volumetric measurements, right? Why do we need to know the volume? Well, we would need to know the volumes of tumours, but that again is a different debate to be had because tumours, the way, the way the clinical profession has measured tumours before 3D reconstruction came about is that they were looking at slice by slice um, images of tumours and they are just measuring a contour. They're, they're not going to work with a, with a three-dimensional entity. However, when they heard we were doing volumes, they said, oh, and can you correlate these volumes with anything else? And it turns out that in some conditions, they take some of the kidney out and they want to know how much is there and how it is functioning and whether, whether the functionality of what's left correlates with the volume. And sure enough, it does. And what we did was to measure the kidney before and after this procedure, and then they have a way of measuring its functionality before and after this procedure. Essentially, the patient goes and drinks some water and then eliminates it, and you measure what goes in and what comes out, and that gives you an impression of how much kidney tissue there is and, and whether it's in a state of producing, of, of, of doing its job in the body. Um, and we are told, so, you know, we do these studies and then the clinicians go away, but we are told that this helps because instead of then having to monitor the patient in the clinic, they now know to evaluate the volume of the kidney and they can tell something about its functionality and what they can expect of that patient. Something else we do is we look at joints. So I have here a mini model of a human hip. There's a, a femur, a femoral bone and a socket, the pelvis, right? And we have a ball and socket joint in the femur. And we've built, what you're seeing here is a, a volume of the bone because it's big and you can recognize it. We've done three, 3D reconstruction of the bones and of the cartilage. The cartilage is the part, the soft part that goes over the bone and it's present in the uh, joint on both the bone and the other bone in the pelvis. And as we all get older and as the population of the globe gets older, more and more people will be in pain and we live longer and we, we sit on chairs for longer and we have all these condi conditions associated with aging. And so the clinicians are in quite a hurry to understand both what happens mechanically and how to treat these patients, when to intervene, how long the treatment lasts. All of these questions are still open questions. And so detecting wear and tear 
on in of the cartilage in a hip joint is really quite important and so we contribute to that by measuring things that happen in the cartilage and we can look at physical things that happen, happen in the cartilage. We can tell, well, it's worn out more on the inside of the joint and not so much on the outside or the other way around. Or that's with a, what's called a morphological MRI. So a water-saturated MRI will give us a shape. We can then analyze the properties of that shape, the thickness. Or we can take a T2 kind of MRI. That's another flavor of MRI. We turn the knobs on the machine, we take a different scan of the same part, body part of the same patient. And even though no wear and tear can be detected physically, the T2 scan gives us biochemical information about the cartilage. And so we can detect where the cartilage is likely to dry out and where afterwards. So these are the sorts of things that we do. Um, just out of the maths. So we're interested in the maths, but our interest is fed by these clinical applications. We also look at ultrasounds. These are ultrasounds of babies at the moment, babies who have a displacement in their hip, so that they were born with their femur not quite in the socket and the femur can become dislocated. It's a condition that can be treated very easily if it's detected in the first week or two of life. At the moment in the UK, not all babies um, receive this scan. So there is a clinical uh, consultation, uh, maybe a midwife consults the baby, but it's not something that is offered routinely. If we can bring this procedure down to something that's automated and cheap, this suddenly becomes available to everybody and we hope to catch more people why would we want that? Well, the consequences of this condition not being treated in the first couple of weeks of life is that in later life people develop osteoarthritis and then they come to us and we scan their cartilage again and we go through the other stuff. But, you know, on a, on a more serious note, it's, it's important to, to detect it early. So we do segmentation for all of these things. In order to do reconstruction, we need to take a scan and we need to segment it. And if you've read a computer vision textbook, um, you might think of segmentation as being this thing. You have an image and you find some contours and you split the image into areas of interest. And this is indeed what segmentation does. And we do this, in some of our methods, we very much do exactly this, but then there is also the other thing called segmentation where you have to also label the, um, the individual parts that you're, you're finding. Um, if you read more modern um, texts on semantic segmentation, you might be looking at maybe the machine learning literature. In the machine le learning literature, semantic segmentation is largely related to things like self-driving cars or interpreting complex scenes. You get a city landscape. There is even a database called Cityscapes. And you are putting a label on every pixel in that landscape trying semantically, trying to find the meaning of that pixel in that, in that image. And this is great. It's also important. It's, it's a task that we need to do more and more. But the accuracy of this doesn't need to be particularly precise. You don't need to know where the little toe of the pedestrian is before you say, there is a pedestrian in front of me, I am going to stop the car here. So you don't wait for every last thing, you just have an impression that there is something like a pedestrian in front of you and then you make a decision on the basis of that very approximate segmentation. By contrast, if you're working with anatomy, obviously you need to know every last pixel if possible. In practice, we don't. In practice, how good is good enough? Well, we'll, we'll see and it depends on the, on the application, but we will have a more precise approximation of, say, organs or other features that we segment than we would in another context. So this stuff comes from data and the data comes from scanners. And I don't know how to use this, so I'm going to do that. Um, 
so scans, you're used to possibly seeing scans as a slice by slice presentation. You put the person in the tube and you make a big noise and whether it's a CT or an MRI, what comes out is a collection of these slices and you don't need to know much about anatomy to recognize that this is going sideways through somebody's head and you're, you're perceiving when their eyes appear, here are the eyes, the person is looking towards my back and you see the various um, formations in the brain and so forth. So we perceive these as a collection of slices. Mathematically, what we're getting out of that is a volume. We put those slices in a box and we treat then every pixel or every voxel, as it's called in, in, the, in the area, as a um, three coordinate representation um, of some form of measurement that comes from the scanner. It can be an intensity, it can be a density. For the CT scans, you get a signal that is proportional to the density of the tissue. For MRI, you get something else. You get how much water there is, uh, whether your array bounced off a protein and so forth. So we're going to apply some stuff to these things and label the pixels and get some plastic spine. How good, how realistic is my plastic spine? Well, we'll have to measure something. And in order to measure how, how realistic our, our segmentation has been, we need to work out how the machine compares to a human. And so, one of the most difficult and time-consuming um, tasks of um, this field is that a human really needs to sit down and analyze the data in the first place. So we need to have some form of human annotation. If we have one human, we don't know how accurate they were. Maybe they're a, a radiology student, maybe they're somebody who's just playing, maybe they're a specialist, we don't know. If we have more than one person, that's even better because then we can look at the differences between them and work out where they disagreed and then maybe allow for the machine also to be less sure around those areas. So between these two raters now, if we have two humans, one of them has selected the kidney and everything inside it what you're seeing here is a slice through somebody's abdomen, but you don't need to know about the anatomy. You can just look at the, um, the contours, right? So this person decided that whatever that black stuff is inside is going to be part of the selection, and this person has decided that it's not, and then our machine will have to make a decision one way or the other. But more seriously, if we have two raters and they disagree, then our hope is, or we, we can then um, state that the machine is accurate enough. This is one measure of enough. It's when the dif difference, the disagreement between the machine and one or the other human is measurably no bigger than the disagreement between the humans themselves. So if we're doing something really precise and if we have the luxury of having multiple raters, then that's one thing we can, we can check. And there are a variety of different evaluation measures. So what we evaluate varies according to the task, according to what uh, we have been able to identify. Um, one of the most common things that we do is that um, we look at where there is agreement. So here you are seeing in the first column what the, the human has measured. So the ground truth is something that we have to believe to be true. It, we know it's not perfect. When, when, if we knew it were perfect, we could call it the gold standard, but we don't. We just say this is some ground truth, some way of saying this is where the feature is. And then the machine also produces some output and then where they coincide, that's a true positive, um, where the machine has given us pixels, but that the human hasn't 
given us. That's a false positive, and you can work out the interpretation of true negatives and false negatives. And then we have different mathematical ways of combining these into different evaluation measures and working out some sort of percentage um, of success. So that's the classical thing that we do. And funnily enough, in the literature, people who work in this area but don't necessarily have a link to a clinical setting um, are still successful at developing algorithms. And there are measures that we can all apply and we all compare our algorithms against each other and we can tell whether my algorithm is better than yours just by picking one of these evaluation measures and saying, okay, I achieved 92.5%, whereas your algorithm only had 89%. And so there is a whole body of literature in the computer science field in the imaging field that does exactly that. People download a database and some annotations, they run their algorithm and they try to outperform the existing measures that have already been published. So that's what we try to do and to a first approximation I think that's what we can do most reliably. Um, so I'd like to talk about a couple of ways in which, in which we do this. Um, and before, before, we do, before we look at the details, um, I'd like to explain the metaphor that we use. So all of these scans are going to give us an intensity. If we have a slice through the scan, and once again you're seeing a slice through somebody's abdomen, You've now seen it enough times that you will recognize it. There is an intensity associated with that. If you turn that into a terrain metaphor, you will have some sort of XY coordinates and the intensity can represent an altitude. And then various algorithms exist that will just process that terrain. We are aiming to find out the peaks or the troughs or other features of that terrain that will correspond to the boundaries between the different structures. Um, we do this, I'm showing everything in 2D because it fits on the screen. So that's a 2D slice turns into a three-dimensional terrain map. What I showed you earlier when I talked about acquiring the data is that we acquire a three-dimensional volume, which then turns into, so if we also take the intensity into account, that turns into a 4D terrain. And I apologize for not putting a 4D terrain on the screen because we can't, right? We, it's hard to visualize it. Um, but that, it's exactly the same idea. So whenever I, I point to X and Y, you can, in your head, make the transition to a, to a higher dimensionality. And those of you who work with even higher dimensional data, you can do the same, but in higher dimensions. So you can always increase the dimensionality of a problem if it helps you solve it. So that's one interesting thing about it. And then the other interesting thing about it is that instead of working with the terrain itself, we can look at where there are cliffs. What we're interested in is working out where the boundaries are between the features. So we go to the, the foot of a hill and we say, oh, look, there's a cliff here for me to climb. That's an interesting boundary. Well, that's something that we can already detect a priori because if we take the gradient in that direction, simple mathematical calculation, we already know that there is a cliff there. So what we do then is we do that as a pre-processing step for all the data and instead of working with the terrain, we work with the gradient of the terrain and we feed that into the processes that we then um, trigger. And then what we do is we start flooding it and you're very lucky here because you're at fairly high altitude. In Oxford, we're very close to sea level and we get a lot of rain. So here are pictures that I've actually taken in Oxford myself. What you do is you take two of these troughs, or all of these troughs, right? You start in two different valleys 
and you start flooding, and when those two lakes accumulate and meet to form a single one, they will always meet across a ridge. And so what happens is that if we can stop the process at that stage and detect the pixels that are involved in that ridge, those pixels will correspond to boundaries between regions of interest. So we get exactly what the initial interpretation of segmentation was in computer vision. So we simulate this flooding and then when we stop it, right, we can stop it at any point. So if we stop it at different points in time, we'll get the shallower um, cliffs first, the, sh the shortest cliffs first, and then as the process progresses, we will get bigger regions, bigger lakes, and bigger lakes still, and it will progress into a coarser environment. So the, the regions that we get get larger at each stage. And the other interesting thing about this is that several of those little regions will get combined into a larger one. So there is, in fact, a hierarchy, and those of you who are doing computer science will, will think of this as a tree. We will know that a large region will have a number of descendants, all of which are part of it geometrically, and that this process gets refined further down. Um, so this is one of the data structures with which we work, and because of the cliffs being natural cliffs in the image, what happens when we form those lakes is that eventually this data structure molds itself around the contours of the features that we actually want to detect. So you can see here, if, if we're staying with the kidneys, you can see that this is the kidney and that large thing is the liver. You're seeing some bright white things here where the vertebrae are. You're seeing the, sorry, the ribs are, and then you, you might see the profile of the vertebra here in the middle of the image. So we are getting some information which then is a natural representation of the anatomy. Even doing this is going to help a user. So the user can then, given this data structure, go and click in some of these regions of interest and select the things that they think are useful and this will give them some representation that then turns into a volumetric representation. So the simplest thing is just to have the right data structure and this already helps the user to segment and, and interrogate the data in ways that previously were not possible, in ways that just contouring does not necessarily help, right? Because what I'm showing you here is a contour, but what you are doing in your head, as we agreed earlier, is that you're thinking this is a three-dimensional structure. So from this, you can get the volume. So this is how that application worked, what that I talked about initially, where we have part of a kidney and that's enough this technique is enough to give you its volume just by adding up the space occupied by the features of interest. So that's one thing you can do, yeah? yeah when uh, you were um, expanding the regions, uh, it was just interesting, uh, did you use dilation or dilation and erosion together? Or it was only dilation of pixels? Uh, I mean, how you feel <coughs> that regions? It, it's, it's an algorithm that um, will climb up the cliff. So I don't think I'd call it dilation necessarily. It would be a way of saying I am at a local minimum. I'm going to look around me and see where I'm climbing. And I'm going to climb in this direction, this direction. And then hopefully if I go this way, when I see over the cliff, I'm going to shake hands with the lake that's climbing on the other side. Yeah, I guess you can call it that. You can call it that. It's, it's, it's simultaneously pro propagating from every m local minimum. So it's not necessarily a convolutional process. Um, so that, that gives you the data structure. 
Now, with or without that data structure, you can dilate, maybe, maybe this is what you're thinking of, I don't know. Um, so, if you know roughly where your feature is, and I'm staying once again with the kidney, I should have brought a kidney, not a spine. Um, you can start a process of growing the region, and this is not necessarily growing it um, in, in, the, in the data structure. So with or without the data, that data structure present, you can start from a point and just um, expand that point into a little lake and into a bigger lake and into a bigger lake still. Um, so it's, it's no, this process is known as, as region growing or fast marching and you have one of the world's experts in fast marching sitting here in the audience. Um, there are a lot of mathematical considerations um, to, to implement and to take into account in this algorithm. It's important to know where to start and at the time we were seeding it by hand, I think, or you can have an atlas-based seeding process. It's important to know how fast to go. If you're in a hurry and you're jumping over all these cliffs, you might jump over a ridge that is of interest to you. It's also absolutely essential to stop at some point. Are you going to let it grow? If you let it grow too much, it might grow somewhere that you don't want it. So there are mathematical considerations um, to be implemented in all of these aspects. The speed, the, the stopping criteria um, are, are all essential. And I think what you're seeing here is a, a way of overlapping some of uh, the results of these algorithms onto data that you have by now become familiar with. Um, and it, it does well enough and it also detects, I remember talking about this procedure at, at a conference on a different topic and somebody said, well, hang on a minute, what this front is doing there, the reason why that has happened is because there are fascias, the, the kidney isn't just floating in thin air, there is a structure, there is a membrane called a fascia that holds organs in place and what your algorithm is detecting is the cliff at the point where that fascia holds um, whatever other tissue is there. So we were inadvertently discovering other anatomical structures that we hadn't even considered at the time. So if we do this in two dimensions, we get the pictures you've seen. Evidently what we do in practice is to build the region hierarchy and to do the seeding in all of the three dimensions. So it's, it could be then a four-dimensional process because we have the three dimensions that go inside our volume of data and then one that represents the intensity and then grow um, from there. And we can either do it a pixel at a time or a region at a time and get different, different criteria, slightly different results. And then there are other mathematical um, considerations to be, to be applied at the end. So if we end up with um, little gaps, I don't know how visible the little gaps are. So the, the liver here maybe isn't completely filled, but we can complete that. There are morphological operations. We can just go and say, if there is a gap, fill that. So that's completely deterministic. This work it predates all the machine learning craze. It predates the existence of GPUs on a commercial basis. It predates all the modern technology that you might be reading about now. But it worked well enough to feed into our clinical applications and we managed to get clinical mileage out of it um, by, by applying these, these algorithms. Clinicians had their own agenda. We were delighted to contribute to that, but the excitement was that we were working with second degree derivatives and, and so forth. So the maths that you are being made to do, keep it under your hat. I don't think I need to say, like if 
of everything that I'm saying today, supervised machine learning is perhaps something that um, even the average person in the street knows about. You show the computer a number of examples. This is the training stage. You, you go through maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of something that it needs to see. And then you show it something fresh and it will give you a prediction on where that thing is that you're looking for. So in our case, where showing the computer or the algorithm will look at a mask. So what you're seeing here is somebody's knee and so knee facing that way, person facing that way. This is this bone, the femur and the pelvic bone. And because it's an MRI of a particular kind, you're seeing the bones in black, right? No disease present. It's just the color that that flavor of MRI produces. And we've done different things with this. So what you're seeing, this, this crescent shape, is going to be the cartilage that's on top of the bone, which is of interest to us because of osteoarthritis. And this other shape is a cross-section through the femur. We generate enough of these masks. So this is the hard work, right? If, if we need to show the machine hundreds or thousands of examples, that's hundreds of hours of somebody's life, right? This is the poor soul, the poor medical student who sits in the basement and draws contours and gets more and more tired, right? Uh, it's a very expensive, both uh, financially, but m more so um, in, in time and effort taken to produce these masks. So if we have these masks, then supervised learning does very well. The problem is that we don't usually have that many masks and the more we ask the clinicians, the less interested they are because they have the clinical work to do. They don't necessarily have the physical power to be doing these things. So there are, and I say here, design a learning model. What you can do if you have an interest in this is to take a model off the shelf and do this. There are public data sets, there are models on shelves there are shelves, <laughs> and you can try and do it and see what you get just by applying the technology. And then this will hopefully get you to think of improvements um, to the algorithms themselves. So we've tried this on a number of things, and you know, when we've tried lungs, when the COVID data started coming out, we did, uh, we did it with COVID data. We got different levels of accuracy on different things. Apparently, people are interested in the, in the back of the eye. I don't know why they need to apply machine learning. The back of the eye is pretty round. I think <laughs> you can probably have a first year project students do. Um, detect that. But anyway, we've tried it. It worked. It's very good. And what you're seeing here is also the transition from a single terrain to a multiple terrain. What's happening? Well, that's grayscale stuff, right? Single intensity. For the color image, you'll get an RGB, red, green, and blue channels. So you'll have three different terrains, and then you have to do some stuff to work out how to combine the, the information that you get in those channels. But nevertheless, you know, you're seeing here a, a back of an eye and some cells that we have selected. Well, somebody has put on a slide that then we photographed and it's the uh, adrenal glands. So there are, there are multiple interesting applications of this stuff. But what do we do when we don't have the clinicians? What do we do when there aren't enough masks um, for, this, for these things? Well, we have to devise another way of going about it. And if we don't have enough clinicians, but we have enough data, we can then consider doing something called semi-supervised learning, which is that we have a large data set, but only few labels for it. And again, I, there are various models out there. People are trying to do more and more complicated things and they pour the data and then they generate something and then it comes back and there, there are equal weight um, agents in that model and there are hierarchical, you know, like a student teacher type hierarchy and there are a variety of different 
uh, conceptually different ways of tackling the problem. But ultimately, ultimately what's happening is that the labeled part of the data set informs the learning process in the usual way. And then the unlabeled part of the data set kicks in at some point and will generate some pseudo labels. And then we have to have a way of retaining or discarding those according to criteria that are no longer based on masks. If I knew that I've generated a label and I have the real label for that image, then I can just compare it against the real label. If I don't have a real label, I need to have some other criteria for tackling that. And again, it can be done based on similarity with the existing labels. It can be done based on other properties of the uniformity of the intensities, different criteria. And it's not just, obviously not just us. So what you're seeing here is our evaluation measures, how many true positives, false positives, all that stuff that we talked about at the beginning. Um, there are, if 10% of the data has been labeled. And we've done exactly what everybody else does, right? We've looked at who else has worked with this data, who else has, has produced algorithms, and we have a table in which we say, well, num our numbers are better. Great. And we've improved it by, whoa, a whole 3%. Um, and that's s roughly where the computer science field is at. This is the typical setup. Um, so oh, I also haven't said, I haven't, I haven't said this is on a cardiac MRI data set. So if you don't recognize the shape of this blob is because you won't have looked at necessarily the heart from that side. Um, so we can improve the performance of how, how well this, these algorithms work on a data set, or we can improve the, the amount of data that's required. So what you were seeing earlier is this. 10% of the data has been labeled, right? Ours is the big thick line at the top, and we have improved it by whatever, 3%. Okay. What we are measuring in this graph is that we're also, we've also tried it, so we've tried the existing algorithms and we tried ours, when five, not 10% of the data has been labeled, so we are doing um, better, and then also when, I don't know what this is, 1% of the data has been labeled. So for a very large data set, this works well. And you can see that we're still getting kind of 70-something percent of overlap. Well, sometimes that's good enough, sometimes it's not. But what we were getting with the, algor the other algorithms was not really usable. So whether 70% is usable is a, is a different question and entirely depends on the clinical setup. Um, but uh, what we're saying here is that if 1% of the data is labeled and the data set is large enough, then we are, we are going somewhere, right? Clearly, if you have 100 points in your data set and you've labeled one, you're not going to get a 70% accuracy. So th this also raises the question of having vast amounts of unlabeled data. And this is the case for semi-supervised, and it's also the case for weekly supervised learning, which I don't propose to cover today. Weekly supervised will be you have labels for a small amount of the data, but the labels aren't even the masks. So they, they will be just some squiggles. And there is a whole theory around that. And I guess it's interesting to evaluate what is good enough, right? What, what are these things for? If I go back to my femoral bone, and here's, here's the cartilage. You can see the cartilage in the, in the pictures. What we've done here, this is the study that looks at the health of the cartilage, the biochemical composition of the cartilage based on a T2 scan. And we are um, producing a traffic light system whereby in red we're saying, well, the T2 composition, the composition in uh, the, the chemical that indicates the cartilage is on its way to drying out, essentially. Um, that, that 
composition is low and then we work out where on the femoral bone, where, where spatially that thing is located. And for that we don't necessarily need a perfect segmentation. It's more important to know where it is and that we've got most of the tissue, but we don't necessarily need a, a perfect segmentation. And what we've also done, obviously, I, don't, I have just the bone here. What you're seeing here is the cartilage overlapped, the, the area of risk overlapped onto the bone so that the surgeon can then work out exactly where it is. So they're going from slice by, for a slice by slice view to a physical model that they can hold in their hands so that they plan their surgery. And sometimes the surgery, if it's, if it's radical, right, if it's hip replacement, then they don't necessarily need to know this. But if it's keyhole surgery, they need to know where to enter the site and how to act on the cartilage to um, remedy some of the condition. So this leaves us with, are we going to let machines do all this, all this work or not? And there have been multiple headlines out in the press, out in the kind of daily media where the machine has beaten humans on whichever diagnosis. There's one on skin lesions that keeps going round. Um, and th there are increasingly, I think we're going to see this um, in, in the press and people are going to embrace this as part of their, their reality. Um, but what we are never told, however much we, we look at those articles and even at the published work, it's not always obvious what the machine was allowed to see, what the human was allowed to see. Did they each have other information about the patient? Did they just make the decision? So I saw one recently on femoral fracture and the machine was only allowed to look at a subset of the pixels or some such and then, then the humans were also uh, only allowed to look at the same subset because it was deemed that that was a fair comparison between the human and the machine. So the human didn't get to see outside the, that, that small subregion either. Again, this is, this is more like an ethical and philosophical debate. Is this a fair comparison? Who beats whom and what are we measuring? Um, but where we are heading is that if we claim that the machine has um, produced anything that is either on a par or better than humans, then the clinicians need to understand exactly why and when and where the machine took those decisions. So explainability is an up and coming field and so rather than just producing the true positives and true negatives, we will increasingly see a need for the medical profession to see similar examples on the basis of which our machine has made the decision or some other criteria that it has taken into account. And so it's important for us to make models which are mathematically robust. It's important for us to explain their decisions. And for that, I would like to stay in a world where we understand our models and don't come up with something so complicated that we don't then, we can't then unpick what has happened. So that's about it. Thank you very much. Um, evidently, I don't do this thing myself. Varduhi has played an important role on a lot of um, this work and there are many other students and research assistants who have also um, contributed. Thank you. Any questions? We try to reduce the noise by smoothing the image in the first place. So there are some steps that I haven't discussed, which is that 
um, if you apply something like a Gaussian filter or anisotropic diffusion filtering, there are all these different things that, that you can apply, then some of the small bumps will disappear. But ultimately, we just have to accept that the, um, the information will not be smooth. In the case, uh, in any case, so you work with, uh, with different modalities again. Mm -hmm. And how the threshold uh, will be counted? Uh, threshold. What is the definition of the threshold for the gradient? The, there are no thresholds involved as such. We just say we want five layers in this hierarchy or 15 or whatever. But um, a lot. Uh, just some kind of difference you need to consider, like uh, this is a real difference, right? So, any type of difference you are considering, like a difference in the pixels, in the voxels? So, yes, any difference will be a difference. Um, and the gradient will tell you how steep that difference is and that's usually enough to just climb so that if I if I'm to stay with the flooding metaphor the water will still go up and sometimes it goes up more slowly if it's shallow and sometimes it goes quickly if it's steep and then if they have a common ridge somewhere then they will meet regardless of the speed at which they have grown. Um, but what I think is also important to note is that the different modalities will have different gradients in, in some of the directions. So for a CT scan, for example, you get very thick slices. CTs are like sending an X-ray through each of, in order to produce each of the slices of the volume, they are sending X-rays in the physical electromagnetic sense which will radiate the patient. So we can't afford to take very fine uh, var variations. So everything is an approximation in the sense that you originally asked the question, everything is an approximation. MRI scans will also have a, an approximation of a cube and, and the signal is approximated and then interpolated across that cube. So ev everything is just an impression of the anatomy that is there. And so if, if in one dimension, if in the dimension of the slices, we get some really rough terrain, we just have to accept that that's the best we can get. Thanks for your question. Hi. Uh, you told in your uh, lecture that uh, MRI could be a very super accurate MRI. Is it possible that, for example, MRI semantic segmentation combined, for example, with resonance RAM spectroscopy, which, is, which has very high precision and accuracy, uh, we, we could see, for example, the accumulation of crosslinks in the brain, for, which accumulate with age. We, 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 for example, 30 or 40 of them with colored images, and which uh, we, they are very small, with one to nanometers in size, mm -hmm. and uh, this di to differentiate a colored with a colored image all these types of crosslinks, for example. So, what is the acquisition like for the spectroscopy method? It's Do a you resonance spectroscopy? Yeah, yeah, but where does the patient sit? <laughs> is it a separate? Is it a separate acquisition step? Do you put a hat on the patient and then? put the patient in the MRI scanner or can you acquire them at the same time? I, I'm, I'm, not a, <laughs> I'm not a doctor, I can't say. Right. So, so the re what I'm thinking here is that if we can acquire them at the same time and overlay them, then there is the spatial co-location of the information. If we acquire them at separate times, then the first thing we need to do is to align the two structures and if we know how to align them then yes we can combine the information but then this alignment which in the field is known as registration this is a really hard problem and so I think that the jury is still out on how to do that in in a way that that matches because there will be a different scale and you know deformation and all that stuff so I don't know enough about the the data acquisition for spectroscopy but if if we had a way of overlaying that information onto structures that we already have from here, then absolutely. And in some sense, fMRI, functional MRI, does something like that, except everything is co-located. So we, we get the signal and it's all there and it's just four-dimensional or something. I think it's four-dimensional information that we're getting. 
But yeah, I mean, let's do it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So if you think of it as a as a grayscale image, I don't know whether you're a computer scientist, but I'll assume you are, and then you can tell me. Okay. Uh, so you're getting the slice, right? What you're getting from the scanner is this picture here. You you don't get it quite so blurry. This is blurry because we're looking at a at a sized down version. So we're not we're, we've simplified it. So for each x and y coordinate, you get a grayscale. I don't know two hundred, and then you say that you are two hundred meters over sea level at that pixel. Pixel next door might be two hundred and fifty four, right? So anything between zero and two five five. And then it will be a collection of bars that will tell you the altitude at every pixel. And you can do the algorithm with that. You know, I'm not saying you can't, but because of what we were discussing earlier, it's quite bumpy. We get better results if we then say, OK, let's do another thing and look at where the cliffs are and then work on this image rather than this image. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, what happens in practice is even more complicated than that because from the CT scanner you get 3,000 values. Yeah. And then, <laughs> good luck, because there aren't 3,000 grayscale values. And so sometimes we work with the raw Hounsfield units that come from the scanner, but that is too much. And so what we do, if we know what we're looking for, if we know that we're looking for, say, a kidney or a liver, we know that the information that we're looking for is around 70 to 90, if I remember correctly, Hansfield units. And so we keep those. We keep everything that has come from the scanner between 70 and 90. And then we compress everything else. So if it goes to 2000, from 90 to 255, we can't fit the remaining 1,930 values, but that's okay because they will not be as interesting to us. So we compress those into the remaining grayscale values at the top. And then we do the same at the bottom. So they come from like minus 1,000, and again, we'll have 1,070 values to compress into 69. But that's also okay because that's not tissue that's of interest to us for the detection of this soft tissue here. Yeah, and for MRI, it's even harder <laughs> because the, the intensities that come into MRI are, don't represent anything that we can intuitively understand. They're just a number. And so we need to work out how to use those numbers, how to turn them into something that's of interest. Sorry, what about... A what about? Sound. Yes. I don't know which way to go. No, this way. No, tomorrow's extra. I don't think I have any ultrasounds. <laughs> this one's ultrasound. I'll, I'll put some ultrasounds into tomorrow's talk. There you go. <laughs> this is like advertising. <laughs> promise of ultrasound. So this is ultrasound. It's ridiculously noisy. So what you're seeing here, this bright stuff is the bone. So it's the pelvis bone, but this time where the baby is lying down. This is, you know, one week old babies. And so they're lying down that way. And then this darker, rounder thing, right? It's obvious to us that it kind of belongs together because we're good at knowing which bumps to ignore. So although it's very noisy and it has those white specks, we can see that that's a single thing, and that's the femoral head, this thing. But if we try to segment it, um, it's harder. Um, so what, what we, nevertheless, what, what, so what you're seeing here is in the middle is what the human has segmented, 
and I'm only showing one human. Um, and then on the right is what the segmentation has segmented, what the algorithm has segmented. But we're not interested here for this problem, we're not interested in the overlap. It's okay that there are gaps at the bottom and that it looks, I mean, this one has probably missed quite a chunk there. But what we're doing with this problem is that we're fitting a horizontal line along the bone and we want to know whether the horizontal line goes roughly halfway through the femoral head, in which case the femoral head is safely lodged inside the pelvis. And if, if it's not, then what we're seeing is that more than 50% of the femoral head is above that line. And this means that the, the pelvis has not developed um, yet. And so what the treatment for that is very easy. Um, the, the baby is then immobilized or, or placed in a particular position in their, in their nappy. Sometimes they wear a harness, but a lot of the time it can be corrected just with multiple nappy wear. I mean, it's, it's really, really that easy. Um, and what we're doing with this, it, it, should we be allowed to scan all babies, which, again, translation, translating this process into the clinic is a whole different can of worms because we need to have all the regulatory approvals, all the... We, we can't just go to the hospital and say, right, we've solved your problem, do it tomorrow. It's much more complicated that, than that, and adoption will take three or four or five or more years. Um, but should we be able to get this to be implemented in every clinic, should we be able to allow for the entire infant population to have an ultrasound? What we're aiming to do here is to say which infants can be discharged without further intervention. And we want to be conservative here, right? We want definitely for these to be caught. And if we get a few of those, if it's maybe 50% or maybe 49%, we still keep them under observation. We maybe call a consultant and get the consultant to look at other factors such as family history and, and all those things that they know clinically about the patient that we don't when we look at the images. But what we want is for the algorithm to be conservative, to allow for infants to be discharged if we can be absolutely sure that they will not develop osteoarthritis too early in their life. And we do this at the cost of increasing the number of infants that get retained for consultation. So the number of false positives can be higher, right? We can tell an infant who is... Um, um, marginal, we can still tell them, well, maybe you have dysplasia. Let's look at you for another week. If you're looking at a different problem, if you're looking at, I don't know, breast cancer, then you want to, you don't necessarily, that's not necessarily a good strategy. So giving somebody a false positive, telling somebody you have breast cancer has such major impact in, on their psychology, they are worried, you might give them more invasive procedures to take a biopsy, so uh, a false positive is not a good, or you know, it, it has to be ad administered with much more care than we would do with this problem. That's clearly my signal that I've spoken too much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.